Well, hi, and welcome to this episode of Thinking Through Theologically. We're going to be talking about uh, progressive Christianity and making some comparisons to uh, what we would call historical Christianity. Um, now, if you didn't watch the last one, we talked about uh, liberal theology versus conservative theology. And in a way, it would be helpful for you to watch that so that you can kind of understand some of the things we may make reference to in this episode here. And if you're watching uh, through YouTube, there's a link you can click on uh, on the screen. You can go back and have a look at that. We'll put that up at the end of the video as well. And um, But in the meantime here, we're, I want to talk about this idea, this, this uh, growing thing called progressive Christianity. And what is it? So... I want to start by reading actually a definition from from Wikipedia. If you if you look up progressive Christianity in Wikipedia, um, there's a specific uh, reference here that talks about its link to liberal theology. Because liberal theology, as we covered last time, is a theology that uh, denies the deity of Christ, that denies the resurrection, that denies the authority of Scripture that um, you know denies the historicity of some of the things that have taken place in the Bible, the stories told in the Bible, and just really leaves some room for some reinterpretation of things. And it developed in the modern era. This uh, progressive Christianity is a postmodern idea. So from Wikipedia, it developed out of the liberal Christianity of the modern era, which was rooted in Enlightenment thinking, as such, progressive Christianity is a post-liberal movement within Christianity that seeks to reform the faith via the insights of postmodernism and a reclaiming of the truth beyond the verifiable historicity and factuality of the passages in the Bible by affirming the truths within the stories that may not have actually happened. In other words, they're trying to find takeaways from things that they don't really think actually happen, okay? And what it's done is it's taken liberal theology, which is a which is a modern idea, and then it has brought in the ideology of postmodernism and kind of married the two together, okay? So it's a combining those two things. It casts aside the absolutes of Scripture and um, what it ha what you end up with is an experientially based faith. Now, I believe that we should experience God in a very real way, but an experientially based faith is a faith that says, whatever I experience becomes my truth, and that for me becomes true, and therefore my experience will shape my faith and the way I view the Bible and the way I view the world around me and the way I view God. And so it is very much an experientially based faith it results in a kind of a personalized version of God, of faith, and of truth, all right? So liberal theology used rationalism to reduce faith to science and society. Progressive Christianity uses liberal theology, but without the rationalism, so to speak, and it reduces faith to personal experience and identity. What you'll find in progressive Christianity is that there's um, there's a fair bit of, of mysticism and New Age ideologies actually that are that are uh, you know syncretized uh, with Christian ideas and they're integrated together with liberal theology and this this thing becomes this new animal called progressive Christianity. Now uh, just let me say up front that a couple things. First of all, not, not all progressive Christians agree on the same ideas and agree on the same things. There's, there's, there's kind of a spectrum. Just like within traditional Christianity, we don't agree on every single doctrine. In progressive Christianity, that's the same too. But there are some core beliefs in progressive Christianity that, that undergird the entire movement. Second thing I want to say is this, is you may discover that if you have a conversation with somebody who is a progressive Christian, you will sometimes find that it's somebody who has come out of historical Christianity, uh, um, traditional Christianity, evangelical Christianity, 
And because of some disappointments or some challenges or some questions or some difficulties, uh, it, it, they've, they had a crisis of faith and ended up moving in this direction. And we've seen that in the deconstruction of faith of, uh, you know, some very popular and well-known people uh, in the Christian world, and some have ended up in this world of progressive, progressive Christianity. So let me talk about five things that progressives do have in common. Number one, they have a lowered view of the Bible. Okay, They don't see the Bible as authoritative, but rather they see the Bible as a partial revelation of God, which is a continuing process to this day. In other words, God is revealed in the Bible, but that's not the extent. They, they go beyond that and they say God is still revealing himself beyond the Bible. And I want to read to you Hebrews 1 verses 1 and 2 because I think this really kind of ties this in. And it says this, In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. That's progressive revelation. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom he also made the universe. So Hebrews tells us clearly that Jesus is this complete and final expression of the revelation of God, that we don't need beyond that. And when he gave us the spirit to lead us into truth, he gave us the spirit to lead us into understanding who Jesus is, because in these last days, this was this final presentation. That's why Jesus could say, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. There, Jesus was the package that helps us understand who God really is. Think about it this way, and this is, you know, might seem kind of humorous to you, but imagine me taking a, a Mozart piece, a concerto or something that Mozart wrote, and reading through his music and maybe perhaps playing the music and saying, you know, there are parts of this music that just don't, they just don't agree with how I think the music should feel. I don't think Mozart, uh, Mozart, <laughs> Moses, I don't think Mozart really meant what he wrote here. And I, I believe that I have an understanding of Mozart better than Mozart did himself. And so I'm going to reinterpret Mozart and I'm going to rewrite part, portions of this concerto in order to better present who I think Mozart really should be. And I'll change some melodies and I'll change some chord structures and this will be the progressive Mozart. That's basically what progressive Christianity is, is it's taking the original authorship and authority of Scripture and then it's basically superimposing their own ideas and saying, yeah, I like that idea, but I don't like that one. I'm going to rework this. And so it really does lower their view of Scripture. Second of all, feelings are emphasized over facts. Okay, so you end up with this, this language of your truth. Uh, I, I read one particular one where they said that in reading Scripture, if you come across any Scripture, that seems offensive to you, then it would be, you could deem it as traumatic and therefore you can reject it because the, God would never want you to experience trauma from scripture. And so you end up with your own version of truth, what I like to call Starbucks Jesus. You get to have the Jesus in any flavor you want. You can have the, your favorite flavor pumps, don't put this in, put that in, now I've got my Starbucks Jesus, okay? And unfortunately in doing that, you lose objective truth. They, they don't believe that there is absolute or objective truth, they only believe in personal truth, all right? Number three, essential Christian doctrines are open to reinterpretation. So key, key doctrines get reinterpreted, the deity of Christ, the resurrection, the atonement, heaven and hell, all of those things are up for redefinition. They're up for, ch for changing what they are, what they actually mean. Number four, semantic theft. And what that means is that they take historic Christian terms and they still use them, but they don't mean the same thing to them. They, they, steal, they steal the term, but it means something else to them. Okay, um, so that way they're, they're not so offensive to Christianity at large, 
And so they'll retain the language, but they'll redefine it. It's subtle it, because you can be in a conversation with a progressive Christian and they can sound like they agree. But when you say, you know, I believe the Bible is inspired, and they'll say, well, I believe the Bible is inspired too. But ask them what inspired means, and you'll end up with a different definition than historical Christianity gives you. They'll say, well, it's inspired, just like C.S. Lewis's writings are inspired, or just just like Martin Luther's writings are inspired. You know, that, that just God inspired them. But they... It, it inspired doesn't mean the same thing to them as it does to us, okay? Something to keep in mind, especially in conversation with a progressive Christian. Number five, the heart of the gospel shifts from redemption to a social message. So, social conscience is huge and important to them. And, and let me say this, the, the gospel preaches this, the Bible preaches this, care for the poor, care for the marginalized, standing up for the weak. Those are things that are part of God's heart. God speaks very highly of how important it is for us to take care of the poor. And, and so I'm, I don't want to diminish that at all. But the core message of the gospel is not the message to take care of each other and to love each other. The core message of the gospel is that Jesus is the Lamb of God who came to take away the sin of the world. That's the core message of the gospel. That gets pushed to the side, and taking care of people and gracious behavior becomes more important than right belief. It's like you don't have to believe the right things. As long as you're being nice to people and being gracious to people and helping the poor and doing good things here in the earth, your belief is not is not nearly as important as your behavior. And yet the entire foundation of the gospel has to do with believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. So there, there's obviously a conflict there as well. Um, so progressive theology, or sorry, now progressive Christianity really becomes a theology of self, okay? It's a, it's a new anthropocentric, that's people-centered version and it fits Jesus into our design. It fits Jesus into our desires. So I start with my identity, who I am, who I think I am, who I believe I am, and then I fit Jesus into that. And so it results in this, this moralism, this, this everybody's good and everybody should do good and we're all good people, let's all be nice to each other, let's all get along. And, and those are all great ideas, but fundamentally, those are more based on Marxism than they are in the Bible and this belief in a utopian society. Uh, but it's not the solution to the world's problems, all right? Uh, the other thing, too, uh, this isn't in my five points, but something to bear in mind is that they always have a tendency to equate love and sexuality as being the same thing. And so they'll say, since love is good, then sex is good in all of its form, LGBTQ, polyamory, any form of sexuality, because you should have a right to express your love. And the Bible differentiates love from sex. Um, and, and although sexuality can be an expression of love, sex isn't love. Love is, is completely separate from sex all, altogether. If Jesus said the first commandment is to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, there's no sexuality in there at all. So that's just, you know, a, a, a thing to keep uh, a mind, or keep in mind rather. So some, some phrases to look out for when you're reading, watching, conversing. If you hear terms like the universal Christ or the cosmic Christ, um, they, they, uh, some of them tend to believe that Jesus and Christ are two separate identities, that Jesus was a human who embodied the Christ, but that the Christ is the, the God who is in everything. And so they have this idea of this, what they call the cosmic Christ, which is present in everything. As a matter of fact, one of them says that the creation is the second person of the Trinity. That, that, that the Christ, the second person of the Trinity, is the created universe. Okay, so there's you know, one of the ideas they have there. They, they very much move toward what's called panentheism. And panentheism is that God is in everything, but God is also transcendent outside, beyond. 
and that that they kind of keep these kind of two working versions of God. And I read one thing where it said, you know, the walls breathe and the floors swell and the rocks, you know, resonate with the with the Christ life in it. And it's like the, these are the kind of the driving ideas is that everything is that and and just tied to liberal theology again, progressive Christianity doesn't believe in a one way to God theology. They believe that, you know, all the paths lead to God. A lot of them are universalists and believe that there is no hell and everybody will just end up together and happy. Some things to keep in mind. Uh, if you hear people say like, well, the Bible has been misunderstood, okay, that can be a little seedling uh, of progressive Christianity. Um, if you hear people say, Jesus actually opposed the Old Testament, Jesus actually opposed the scriptures of the Old Testament and corrected them and made changes to them. That's just not true. Jesus affirmed, he said, not, not one jot, not one tittle, not, not a dotted I, not a cross T of the, of the scriptures will be changed, you know, until all is fulfilled. So Jesus didn't alter Old Testament scripture in that kind of a way. Uh, they really downplay the Apostle Paul. They say Paul was just a guy who infused his own ideas about God. He was just a guy who had a deep encounter with the universal Christ, but then he personalized it. And so his writings are very sexist. His writings are very anti-gay. And that those, those things are not things from God. Those are just Paul's own opinions. And they'll do those things that. Um, another statement you might hear is, God cares more about how you treat people than about what you believe. Well, God cares about how we treat people. But, you know, if, I mean, it, if I believe in, 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 in pixie dust and rainbows and leprechauns, I think it's going to make a difference, you know, regardless of how I treat people. Uh, God cares about what you believe because the Bible says in he Hebrews eleven six. 6, Without faith, it's impossible to please God because those who come to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Okay, so let me finish with this passage of scripture in 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3 to 5. And this is really key and it's something good for anybody to know. The Apostle Paul is writing here to the Corinthian church and he says this, For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. So I'll just stop right there. This is the language that is used uh, even, in the, even in Judaism of the day. This is the language of passing on creeds, okay? A, a, a creed is a statement of belief that one adheres to and holds to as truth. So what Paul is saying here is, I am about to quote to you something that has been an accepted creed, an accepted belief in the church, and I received it and I'm passing it on to you. And here it is, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and the, that he appeared to Cephas, which is Peter, and then to the 12. And then he goes on and talks about 500 and himself as well, and so on and so forth. But this statement, scholars say basically state that this statement was a creedal statement that that may date as far back as 35 AD that this was a fundamental creedal statement of the Christian church since its earliest days that Christ died okay not Jesus aside from a cosmic Christ that Christ died number one, for our sins, that substitutionary atonement, that means he didn't just die to set an example, he died for our sins, according to the scriptures, which validates the Old Testament scriptures, it doesn't set them aside, it validates them, that he was buried, which speaks to a physical death, that he was raised on the third day, the fact that he was buried and raised on the third day speaks to a physical bodily resurrection according to the scriptures, which again ties into that reality of the Old Testament being valid. And then it goes on, he appeared to Peter and then to the 12 and then to 500 people, you know, at the same time, many of whom were still alive. They still had living witnesses at the time that could corroborate 
the physically resurrected body of Jesus at that time. So this brings the historicity of the Bible into, into a great place of strength. So hopefully this will help you kind of understand what some people are needing to navigate right now. And some people who are exploring it, just, just you know, don't get on their cases, but ask them questions. Challenge them to go back and I think the onus is on them actually to disprove historic Christianity. It's not on us to prove it. We've already got 2,000 years of evidence. I think it's up to them to show that Jesus didn't rise from the dead. And if he didn't, then they have a lot of other questions to answer about the cascading effect of that resurrection or non-resurrection in their case. So historic Christianity is the same as conservative theology. We hold that the Bible is the word of God, that Jesus was conceived, born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, died on the cross for our sins, rose again, ascended to heaven, and gave the Holy Spirit to those who would put their faith in him, and that redemption is found in Jesus Christ and him alone, and that the word of God is the final authority for our faith and for our behavior. So I hope that helps you. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not out to criticize people, but at the same time, we need to be aware of what is in motion because even evangelical churches have begun to embrace bits and pieces of conservative Christianity already. And if we're not careful, it's subtle and then it'll take people to drift off. So keep an eye out. Keep an eye out for those things. Keep your heart right and keep the Word of God first and foremost as your core of truth. And uh, if you're watching on YouTube, please like, share, subscribe, uh, share this with your friends, and hopefully, um, you know, other people can benefit from learning a little bit about these things as well. Bless you. Have a great day.